So here we are, a mid-test match Gali to Gali episode. We thought Pakistan is slightly on the ascendancy, so we'd seize the opportunity to finally heap some praise on Pakistan cricket. Uh, after a great half an hour in the uh, second test match in Multan, where Pakistan seemingly are in the driving seat. But don't get, get me wrong here. I think England probably likely favours because the inevitable third innings collapse for Pakistan is to come. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think Pakistan cricket has given us enough reason not to be overly optimistic in, in recent it's, times. Yeah, I mean, I think there's only one word for it. It's lottery. It, I mean, it is yeah. the, the lottery <laughs> that is Pakistan cricket. You know, I mean, I, I think we should even stop doing these videos because there is no <laughs> point previewing anything to do with Pakistan because it's just, you know, like nobody can sit here and say, oh, you know, I told you so or whatever because... Honestly, nobody really knows. I mean, <laughs> you know, like I know Akib Javed will be getting a lot of credit for this, for Kamran Kulam and all this spinners, because he's been saying on national television for a long time to play and three. Professor spinners. Hafiz. <laughs> and Professor One. Hafiz, you know, the turner, the t- turning wicket and all. But, yeah, you know, it could have so easily been this and we would have been, you know, we would have lost the toss and it would have been all over. So, you know, I mean, uh, but... And I think this is a good segue before we go into the match to talk about the real, you know, question yeah. that's burning on everyone's mind, right? Was yeah. Babar Azam's drop and Shaheen and the scene, but I think yeah. Babar Azam is a clear, clear uh, yeah. headline. Mid series after the first series in favor of Kamran Ghulam, the right call. Now, you and I have cheated yeah. a little by waiting till Kamran Ghulam scores a hundred. Yeah, look, I think yeah, just, just before we we go, yeah, yeah. It was the right decision. It was the no, right no, I decision. think. Before, yeah, I know, I know. Look, I think a couple of things. One, uh, yeah, we'll, I mean, the test match will play out as it is, you know, so let's not really go into the love deal. But uh, by the time this episode goes out, England are probably 480 for six. This uh, may be anyways, well or not. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, the, yeah, the point of the episode was to actually, you know, discuss the whole barbarism and shine thing. Look, I mean, I don't know about you, Moin, but if you look at my prediction in the previous, previous I episode, say, I did say... Babar Azam should be kicked out. No room for sympathy. Uh, I think, yeah. And, you know, the way he got out in, in both innings in the previous test match, I think how badly Pakistan lost and all those things. He had to go. Honestly, he had to go. Yeah. And and so, and when you have someone like Kamran Ghulam who's doing so well in domestic cricket, and look, I'm not, maybe I'm a little bit, but you know, I'm not jumping on the bandwagon in hindsight, but you know, the guy deserves a chance. What else do, does he do? He scored runs in the first like, right? he was He scored a couple of hundreds in the, okay, it was an ODI format, but still he got a couple of, or one day format. He still got a couple of hundreds. So you need to give him a chance and you have to give him a chance against the one batter who's probably failing the most. You know, everybody in isolation has put up, a, you know, scores here and there. And Ed Barber is the only one who's failed consistently and had to be dropped. So, yeah. So look, I, uh, you know, and I agree with you, right? Uh, I had previously said, and I maintain that over, like, if you asked me and g- gave me no context whatsoever, I would have said dropping a player and a and an important player mid series is often not a good idea. You either drop them before the series or you drop them after the series because mid series is a s- sign of panic. It means that you cannot go proceed with plans that you made ahead of the test series and it ends up looking like but also i mean forget looking like it doesn't matter what we look like i mean you know we're clowns anyways but it's more about it ends up being a knee a knee-jerk reaction right that's why typically and my keyword here is typically i would be against making these whole scale mid-series changes to the squad now there are two points i will make one is the the point I just said at the end, which is squad, right? There is nothing wrong with dropping players. Or well, just matches. just to correct you, just to correct you, they've not been dropped; they've been rested, according yeah, to Azar Mahmood. I know, I know, but <laughs> let's call a spade a spade. They've been dropped. So, I, um, if if they were just dropped from the game uh, for the next game, that's normal. Right, so I don't agree with a lot of the the criticism at the decision that's being levied, even by Pandit saying that. Oh, actually, you know, you give them the whole series. Yes, you give them the whole series in the squad. Fine, but I think it's semantics. 
Right, ba- Babar Azam fa- could have easily re- been, you know, remained part of the squad, but then not played the second test match, and perhaps not even played the third test match. I don't know, right? Because I think if you're going to give Kamran Kolam a chance, you need to give him more than one chance, obviously, right? So I think the PCB said, look, why not give Babar this time to rest away from the limelight, away from the squad, right? Time to recoup and recover. And actually, I kind of agree with that, right? In this context, because in this context, you have to remember that here's a guy who's knocking on the door for the last sort of three, four years, at least. You also know that this is the end of your home season, right? You give Barber the whole chance, uh, these three test matches, and poor Kamran Golam starts, ends up making his debut in South Africa, for God's sake, which is hell for any uh, Pakistani batter. Uh, who's making their debut. So you've got to be fair on him. And poor guy has waited for so long. And obviously, he's not going to succeed that successfully. Or chances are he won't in South Africa. And then he'll be dropped and away from the national conscience for the next 10 years. And then his career is over. So I think it, it necessitated making a clear incision into the squad to give Kamran Kolam these two test matches because it was the right thing to do for him and for the squad, right? Everybody looks at it from Barbar Azam's perspective. And maybe for due, for good reason. Oh, you know, he deserved to be given the option. He deserved to have a say. Or they'll say things like, oh, you give him the full series or you give him, or, or you don't give him the series at all. Look, you can't go back in time, can you? You can't. So, yeah. Stop saying these things, right? It's about whether you drop him now or you keep him in the, uh, in the playing 11, okay? And as I said just now, given the context and looking at it from Kamran Golam's perspective as well as what the team needs, because he is your lowest performing player. And I, it's, I, I read somewhere that, oh, yeah, if you say two years, it's a long time. But if you say nine test matches... It doesn't sound that long. Well, actually, nine test matches is 18 innings. For me, that's quite long. And two, it's not like he's excelled in the limited overs format either, right? Yeah. He's just been bad overall. So I think it's the right decision. And and if he was just dropped from the playing 11, no one would have raised... Oh, not many people would have raised alarm bells around or oh, dropping him mid-series from a squad because you pick and drop players from the 11 all the time, no matter how big or small exactly. you are. Right, exactly. like this, and I actually think dropping him from the squad at this point in time is actually the right thing because you know he's not going to play the third test match. You have to give Kamran mm. Kolam at least like a few chances, right? And now, obviously, he's cemented his place for the next match after his hundred. But you know, you you just have to do that. So why not just give him give Barber his time back to spend with his family and recuperate? So I actually yeah. am in favor of the decision. Um, and you know, uh, you know, and I, I think, I, and I actually applaud the selectors for making that call because it wasn't an easy one. Yeah, no, I think it makes sense. I mean, you know, we've heard about mid-series squad changes and all that, but we had a whole selection committee change in the middle of the series, which I've never heard of. <laughs> Yeah, that's the bigger one, right? That is the bigger thing, right? <laughs> and, and you mentioned panic, right? And I think I think dropping Barber was not the panic because I kind of expected it. He shouldn't have been in the first test anyway. But anyways, the panic button, in, in my opinion, was the fact that I, you've played three spinners please? and ended up deciding to play on the same track and, you know, playing with half a fast bowler, you know, who's a batting all-rounder who got injured as well, still managed to bowl a, a few overs in. So I think that is where the panic button really was pushed, not in Bar- in terms of Barbarazza. I completely uh, agree. I completely yeah. agree. It has to be like, you know, I mean, I, I, I think Daniel this will put it really well in his Greek Info article where he's like, it's like a student who realizes he's prepared for the wrong exam. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh, oh, he's got the syllabus wrong. And, he, you know, and everything he's learned is out of the syllabus and he needs to like do a last minute mm-hmm. cramming before his exam. It's literally that, right? Yeah. But I have to say, changing your ways, it takes guts. It takes guts to say, you know what? We're just, it can't get worse yeah. than this. We're going for rank turners and we're going to equip our spinners. Yes, our spinners aren't great, which is why they probably can't get purchased on flat wickets. But on spinning wickets... It's less about the quality of spinners and more about the quality of batters against that spin. And yeah. 
that's where we'll capitalize. So, so I don't think that was panic. The one thing that I did think was panic was three spinners. And I, I think it's a function of panic and also Pakistan just not knowing which spinners to play. So they'll be like, you know, might as well play all of them. And to be honest, it ended up being the right decision because if you had to only pick two before the test match, you would have probably pick Noman and Zahid Mahmood because you don't want all finger spinners, right? You won't yeah. because Salman Aga is also there, Saud Shaqeel, Sam Ayub, we've got three part-time finger spinners. You would have 100% played Zahid Mahmood, who was the weakest of your three spinners today. And you would have probably gone with Noman only because Sajid Khan was given a chance in Australia and he didn't do very well. And, and like Noman just tends to at least be economical, if nothing else. And Sajid has has not succeeded, even though he's had a little more opportunity recently. But there you have it. I think ultimately they went with three because they weren't sure. You know, you had a few people who had never even played first class cricket since January, you know. So you had to give it to all three. But, you know, I think they've missed a trick. And the trick for me is uh, someone who's good with reverse swing. Right. I mean, I think they would have benefited from having one extra pacer. I think especially if yeah. they lost the toss. I, I think Zaidu and I have discussed at length. Mir Hamza is your best test fast bowler. And 100% yeah. he should have been in the first test match. But if you're preparing a dry wicket like this, then you need someone who excels with the old with the older ball. Reverse yeah. swing. And Mir Hamza's second and, third over, uh, second and third spells tend to not be that penetrative. He's only... He's really good with the new ball, but I, but his stats with the older ball suggest that he's not the best exponent of reverse swing. So actually, yeah. it may have been Nassim Shah who would have been your best yeah. goal. So that's where the panic button. Yeah, is but set. the poor the poor guy bowled two thousand overs, so you know True. you don't want to bowl him to the ground. So so I think, you know, yeah, yeah, maybe someone with a bit more bit more pace. Uh, we got limited options there, right? But. Um, but yeah, I think Miramza was the was the obvious option. I think he's still in the squad, so that, I don't think there's an injury concern there. I might be wrong, um, but I think yeah, that, that was the only question that, that that we had. But like you say, it probably would have been for Sajid, and then Sajid was the one who kind of has brought Pakistan back in the game, and Noman actually with the bat, <laughs> you know, with the ball, but also his his late order batting uh, kind of helped helped out. And at one point, you you were in this really dangerous situation where Amir Jamal got injured while batting, I think, and then he couldn't. Well, he was limping and he had a hip injury and then you didn't know if he could even bowl. He didn't yeah. end up bowling. But that's a high-risk game, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you end, you end up with three front-line spinners and that's it. And, you know, knowing a team like England, if they get going, then they could literally have smashed a thousand runs, which we were fearing at one point. We absolutely <laughs> so, were. So, so then it was a high-risk game, but it's come off. Come off. Yeah, and I think all said and done, right? I think they absolutely would have considered Mir Hamza. Yeah. But I think what put them against Mir Hamza was just because he's not been as effective with the older ball yeah. and reverse swing would be more important here than conventional swing. So then it becomes a case of, then, you know, uh, you know is Mir Hamza actually the right answer? Or should we go with three spinners? And if we don't go with three spinners, the other question was, which spinner do you drop? And if you don't have a clear answer on that and your fast bowling option is probably not best suited to the conditions, you probably would be tempted to play all three. And that's what yeah. happened. And we are where we are. Okay. Yeah. Luckily, no, I think that that, that makes sense. And maybe India yeah, day four or five, that that might be even more and more crucial. Uh, assuming Pakistan don't have their uh, usual third innings um, collapse. But but look, I think back to the whole Babar Azam thing, right? I think there were a lot of interesting things said. I mean, Ramiz Raja, I don't know what he saying about Pakistan's going into this test match without a superstar and this and that. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. I do respect but the guy, you know. What I I, hate. That's yeah. what I hate that time. I'm so glad you brought it up. I mean, that's what, what you what call difference does it make? Yeah, yeah what exactly. Does what it difference does it make? Like, if he's a superstar, if he's not performing, he shouldn't be in the team. And then of course, that Fakhar Zaman tweet, I mean, I don't know if it was like his PR team or the that agency that they're all working with. I mean, forget the Virat Kohli uh, comparisons. I mean, there is no comparison. I'm but why? I mean, that. you're a current player. You know, you're an active player in the team. How can you even say something like that? I know Hassan Elgar also tweeted something. His was a bit more like, you know, we can you come back stronger and something like that, which is yeah, fair. Yeah, like say Dunvar. Like say Dunvar. And say Dunvar yeah. was an explain. Like that's what you say. Look, Fakhar Zaman. I, I'm sorry to say that disappointed me. So now I know some people are saying, oh, he's probably going to be your next captain in limited overs. Oh, oh, no oh why chance. not test him? No chance. Especially, I mean, this shows you the emotional maturity of these players, right? I read a tweet, Kevin Peterson, and I think I can resonate. 
I can un- empathize when he said, "Unreal skill and talent, no question, but they don't train very hard, the players, and there's too much emotion attached with winning and losing. So they just take mm-hmm. ages to get over winning and losing, and they focus more on that than their own game and improving and self developing their game. As you can see here, Fakir Zaman is worried about Babar Azam rather than working on his own game, and he na- he needs to remember that you know s- slightly selfishly, Babar Azam." Demoted Fakhr Zaman in the T20 lineup, right? <laughs> Could Fakhr Zaman have broken more records had he opened in T20 cricket, played in the power play? Perhaps. Now I'm not blaming Babar, but I'm just trying to say that look, everybody has to just remember that there is nobody more important than the country and 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 the badge that you represent. You know, I, I think someone said it. I can't remember who. And it's like you you need to play. For the badge on the front of your jersey and not the name at the back, right? I think it's Gary Kirsten who said it. Was it Gary Kirsten or Jason Gillespie? I can't. I think it's Gary Kirsten. Yeah. Who was it? Yeah, Gary Kirsten. And I think that's really important for us because, I mean, yeah. if, like, fuck, someone needs to understand why that actually the comparison to Virat Kohli is detrimental to Babar. But if you notice yeah. his career has derailed once everyone started taking that comparison slightly seriously because he could not take yeah. the. Uh, take the pressure. It just came too soon for him, and you can't compare. India had someone like Virat Kohli who had consistently delivered match-winning performances in Test cricket for many years, uh, not match-winning than match-saving, but or, or sub performances of note. And in limited overs cricket, he was winning you games left, right, and center. Babar Azam has had none of that, and it just goes to show. And imagine what a poor Kamran Golam would think about. A st- uh, you know, so, exactly. So like, you know, like he'd be like, "Oh, all the CD players already hate him because he's filling the shoes of a potential all-time great of Pakistan batting." And he's anyways under a lot of pressure. He knows that. As senior players, you should have redirected that tweet to Kamran Golam and wishing him the best of luck. But the way Kamran Golam mm-hmm. thinks about it, he's probably thinking like, loads of people are expecting him to fail or want him to fail, and that's a yeah. terrible feeling to have. Yeah, I think it's it's. Uh, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what the next Lord Kalandra's meetup is going to be like for Khurzaman and Kamran Gulam. But I just like you say, it it all comes down to the maturity. And you know, I think the other thing about Babar Azam getting rested or dropped is probably the, the 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 side which is less said or talked about is the whole politics and the grouping and and all, all those issues, which seem to have come to the fore a little bit more with these tweets. I mean, why else would someone? Why would fuckers want to do something like this, right? I mean, there's must be some sort of a, I don't want to say agenda, but some sort of a connection going on. So I think there's part of it is probably that as well, where you've gotten rid of Shine, you've gotten rid of Barber, and maybe from a team culture point of view, it might end up you know doing doing well. And that's why, to be honest, like they've at least from a Pakistan team point of view, they've made some changes. They've tried to have a plan in place, and even if they lose, which they probably will, I. Would not be that disappointed with this defeat because you know they've given it a go, uh, they've changed things around, they've thought something through, and and you know England are on paper as well a much better team, and you know you're not, you know it's it's tough to beat them for, for Pakistan at least. I think yeah, I mean PCB have going to take action against him. Yeah, and again he he's put himself and his buddies ahead of the team. Look, um, and again, like it's, he's not a super like I mean whatever it is he's he's a very very good player he's got great talent but he's not performed and if you don't perform that's it this is professional sports right it's not your backyard where yeah, you can absolutely. get to bat first and bowl first absolutely it's one of those that you're playing with your friends and you know you're the first name uh, that your yeah. friends will pick you know what i mean like it's it's not like that um coming back to i think the team i think look people will say a lot about shan masood people will question whether shan masood should remain captain if Pakistan end up losing 3-0, which is probably the most likely scenario. Right? I, you know, I I know I criticized him for his selection in the first test match, and that still remains valid. But I genuinely believe that just changing a captain does not alter results so significantly as we think. Right? Look at England. In 2015, after the debacle, they persisted with Owen Morgan. And he's the one who actually brought England out of that rot, right? Or that rut, rather, you know, because in and, and his performance wasn't that amazing at the time either, right? So I think 
it's clear looking at this test match that at least they were trying different things. Now, I'm hearing reports that Shah Masood was just silent and he eventually agreed with the decision to drop Babur, but he wasn't one of the pro you know, people, which tells me that the guy is not here to play politics. He's not here to take Babur out because uh, Babur is probably the one that, you know, uh, who, you know, has his eyes on captaincy or has been a former captain, so it's tough to tough to uh, manage. Uh, he's just looking out for the team. So he, he knows Barbara Azam is a really good player. But I think eventually hearing the arguments around, he felt that it was you know valid to drop him. Yeah. I like that approach, right? Yeah. I like that approach. Uh, my issue with Shah Masood is his talent and his skill. And whether that skill merits a place in the team. Because I'm, you know, Kamran Ghulam has done it today and he's shown you yeah. what our quality of talent on the bench can look like, right? The issue is we don't have faith in our own first-class structure, which is why we, especially on the batting front, bowling, we get them in at 18 years of old. Bat- batting, <laughs> the guy, Garmin Garmin's 29. How can you justify and tell me that Herrera won't won't uh, do something similar when he gets his chance? You know what I mean? So yeah. I think that's something to keep in mind. For me, it's less about Sean, the captain, it's more about Sean the batter. And there'll come a point when you can't separate the two, just like there was with Salfraz. Yeah, Sean Masood's true. 150 will, it, it, going by his past record, will be followed by a, like a string of low scores, and like single digits, ducks, whatever. And that's just not good enough. And he's a better player than that. Yeah, I mean, maybe he's not because that's what his average maybe is. Maybe he's right? not. Maybe he's 30, not. Average of 30 or whatever it is. So, or 29. So I think that that's maybe his his ceiling. But look, I think for for the others, you know, when we mentioned Herrera, I, I can still understand that, although I had him to to um, to play in this match as well. All the other batters, you know, apart from Barber in the last three test matches have at least scored a 50 plus score, right? So, I mean, Sam's got a 50, Shafiq's got a 100, uh, Rizwan... Salman, so they've shout Sakil, so they've all got fifty plus scores in the recent past. So I think that it, there is more of a case to keep them in the team, right? Uh, so, so I, I, it, it makes sense. So I, and, I, I'm and, not and, that disappointed by that. Uh, no, no, but, and also but, yeah. to be honest with you, if anything, this sends a strong message to everybody that no one is yeah. above the law, right? Yeah. If you're the worst performing batter, you're out. I don't care what your exactly. name is, right? Exactly. Or oh, how pretty you look. The one yeah. thing I'll say though is. Now, there are lots of questions on what, whether Pakistan would be happy with their 366 that they ended up with. And look, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing and all that. But at that moment, the best way to assess that is looking at the number of starts you got. And that's the disappointing thing. If you look at Pakistan's scorecard, yes, you had Sami, you had 77, he should have got a bigger score. Kamran Gulam could have even got a bigger score. He eventually got up, but he still got up. I mean, he got 118. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to say much about him. But Sammy Yoop, 77. But for me, the big failings was number six, number seven, and to a small extent, if you count Ahmed Jamal as a, as a gentleman all round, and number eight. You have three batters, six, seven, and eight, who all scored 35 plus. Right? I think one of them was in the 40s. The others were in the late 30s, mid to late 30s. That's criminal. That is criminal in test cricket of the highest standard. You cannot get starts and throw them away. That's why when it ended at 366, I was disappointed. I don't care what the pitch is saying. The pitch is actually telling you that once you get your eye in, it's tough to get your eye in firstly. Very tough to get your eye in. But once you get it in, it's much easier to play. And that increases the value of your wicket because it's always tougher for a new person to come in, as uh, as we saw when England were batting. The minute yeah. Duffy got out and Root got out, the floodgates opened yeah. because it's tough to get your eye in. I'm disappointed that Pakistan still are in that old habit of not being able to convert their starts. And that's yeah. what anyone looking at a scorecard should assess when trying to figure out whether the team will be happy with their first innings total. Yeah. And I think Pakistan should have got at least another 60, 70, at least 400 runs. If one of them converted to a bigger score, yeah. you would have had a much... You, I mean, it's it's, psycholog- it's, it's a psychological yeah. advantage. Yeah, I mean, yeah, time will tell, I guess, if it's 35 runs too less or 15, 20 runs too much 
given 350 at 19 for two you'd have taken 350 i guess on on paper so, so yeah, true 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 I, I, yeah. i'm trying to isolate uh, from the result you know yeah. i know i know i i i i get that and i mean when when joe root gets out in the 30s then i guess the rest can be forgiven as well <laughs> that's very true so she after 262 but yes um but uh, but yeah i think it's it's still lots lots of cricket left in, in the test match um the only other couple of minutes we'd spend is on is the new zealand india test match which seems to be well rain today forecast for rain for the next couple of days as well maybe we'll see another heroic india performance where they win it in five overs I mean, india need <laughs> india need one day to win a test match okay they need one and a half days and two absolutely heroic performances as you say to win them so i'm not yeah. worried if i'm if, if you're an indian supporter as long as india have one and a half days to play i think we're going to be okay um now obviously i'm i'm being a bit tongue in cheek there uh you know it's it's a shame we would have got to see good cricket also bengaluru which is a high scoring ground yeah but it is what it is um if anything this has just taken a new zealand victory out of the equation and uh, and and it's either a draw or an indian win so that's that um look right this session is rare right ever since we've started <laughs> recording uh it's been more gloom and doom than it has you know uh periods of joy and all and look I, again as you say i don't want to talk much about the test match because when this by the time this is recorded this a lot of this will be rendered irrelevant but at this point in time at the end of day 2 pakistan can breathe a sigh of relief pakistan yeah. can think that whilst the way it has come about in terms of spinners leading the way and probably not the best of spinners is perhaps not the most pakistani like way of doing things but then i take you back to miss baul haq who was the most unpakistani of pakistanis when he brought that <laughs> level of stability at a, at a time yeah. when we were probably at our worst so perhaps that's what we need yeah. and it just is a reminder that yeah, yeah what i said before psychology of sport makes such a big difference if you go out there with the right intent with the right attitude you can make something of the game right and the yeah. talent will always follow where the intent and approach is correct so for rare time where i'm going to say actually it seemed knee jerk and it probably it was knee jerk but somewhere we landed on something that you might say is a little more sustainable than a lot of your cricket uh, pundits and <laughs> and journalists are saying in interbrill yes. pakistan match even in icc tournaments right they mix and match and they put everyone in a blender and like see what comes out and eventually the right combination <laughs> shows i mean up. this is I mean, it's just too late so quintessentially <laughs> us you know why did we doubt this i i'm disappointed that you and i even doubted this we should have predicted this four days ago that obviously in pakistan right really like completely like boss uh the first two days of the test match because you know that's how we do things right this how we do yeah But I think we were worried for the first time. We were like, you know what? I don't think this team can actually bounce back. As no, I, I was ready for it for for like a hammering after Pakistan scored three hundred, and when England had that start, I thought this is it. Like they'll score another six hundred at realistic, and we lose by an innings. That was my realistic. <laughs> can you bat? But no, yeah. and, and, and look, a lot of that may still happen. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But but the point is, I think it's quite liberating sometimes to come from a position of sheer weakness when you say it can mm-hmm. only get better. and it's that which said you know what like yeah. forget all the all the textbooks we're doing it our way well look guys yeah. um let's see this is you know we don't typically review mid test match so now the jury's out on whether what we've said will hold true by the end of tomorrow but yeah. we'll be back for for, for the review question. we'll be back for the review once the test match is actually done and we'll nitpick on everything uh Also, we, we've got crossed uh, 500, so we'll do something on that as well to celebrate. Congratulations to all our viewers for helping us get there. 500. Hopefully, we'll um, not freeze at 556. And <laughs> <laughs> oh no! We'll go way, way beyond that. Uh, I'm going to create a fake account and like make it 557. As soon as we get to 556, no, no, no. <laughs> but, but I know I, I trust our fans to get us there. But look. 
<laughs> hopefully, look, it wasn't by the end of the test, but hopefully by the end of the series, we get to 823 subscribers, right? It's yeah. bold, it's ambitious, but we can do it Let's if you keep it. supporting and um, uh, watching. Thank you. And we'll speak for the review. Thank you.